Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sam, for those of you who don't know me. Um, thank you all for allowing me to come speak tonight. I'm very excited. Um, and I feel like God has been putting so many different things on my heart throughout this season. But by his grace, I feel like he's helped me put it all into one message that I really hope um, and pray that will bless you all and help at least one of you um, in some small way tonight. So I really hope that he just speaks through me. Um, but before anything, I just want to personally say that I love each and every one of you, that I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. I think we can all agree, um, kind of as we'll talk about more tonight, that this season has been very dark um, and very tumultuous. But this Bible study in, in particular, um, I know a bunch of us are in some other ones, but this Bible study in particular has just been such a constant um, in my life since the pandemic started and um, through everything and peep, stop laughing. And um, I just want to say thank you for that. I love you guys um, and praise God for that. So before anything, please bow your heads with me in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity to just talk about you, Lord. That's my favorite thing to do. And I just want to share. And I pray that you would use me as your vessel. I pray, God, that you would just speak through me and that this word would bless at least one person, God. I just pray that your will would be done, Jesus, that you would be with us all here, Lord, that you would open every heart, every mind, every ear here, Lord, including my own. I just pray, God, that you would help us to hear and listen what you are speaking, God, because you are in this place and you are with us, Lord, in this moment. And we praise you and we thank you, Lord, for this, this space that you give us every Wednesday, God. May we not take it for granted. It's in your precious name that I pray. Amen. Okay. So we're going to be getting into the word a lot tonight. Um, we're going to be spending a lot of different, or we're going to be spending some time in a lot of different scriptures, which I personally think is always a great thing. Um, but the overall theme of what I want to talk about tonight is what the heck God is doing in this season of our lives. And I know that's kind of been a redundant question, but I want to talk about 2020, which some of you may or may not be very, very sick of at this point. Um, but I really want to talk about it specifically with the lens of our faith um, and really delve into the internal work that I feel as though God is doing um, within each of us during this time. Um, but before we get started with any scripture, I want to open it up and ask a question. Um, what is one good thing or one not so good thing? I, we're going to avoid the word bad, as you'll see later on. Um, that has happened to you this year in, in this season related to the pandemic, related to the racial injustice, related to athletics, um, hobbies, whatever. What have you gained from this chaotic season of life? And equally as important, what have you lost? What have you learned? What have you not learned? Anyone can answer, anyone can contribute, but I wanna really hear from you guys as to um, what your answers to those questions are. And don't make me call people out because I will. I will. Yeah, Weezy, yeah, Weezy, I'm, I'm looking at you, baby. All right, I'll go first only because Sam told me I had to speak. Um, I did, I did tell her before you had to, okay. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely something I think I've gained during this time has been, like, perspective, just how easily, like, some things can be taken from us, and just, like, more perspective about what is really important um, in our lives, and I think something I've lost, um, obviously, just, like, the opportunity to compete and, and play our sport this season, for sure. Yeah, thanks, Weez. Anyone else? Um something oh hi everyone i'm krista i don't play a sport here but i somehow found this um through this pandemic i like seriously grew my faith i like kind of was lost before in terms of my relationship with god mm -hmm. and kind of just like being like by myself but with him and like growing with him and through you guys like learning about him like, I truly have gained a solid relationship with him that's still growing, which is exciting. Anyone else? Something that I've gained um, throughout the pandemic is definitely just, like, realizing, like, with my family, how much they mean to me and, like, how important it is to value the time that you do get with them. 
Mm. Um, I think that really was an eye opener in this season of life. I would say for me, um, something that I gained was uh, the ability of looking back of uh, my wrestling career and thinking, wow, this is like the first time ever and that I've taken a break from training, 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 and I couldn't do anything about it. And I was like, I think this is a good thing, you know, I can look back and and uh, think critically about some of the things that maybe I should be doing more, you know, instead mm -hmm. of uh, um, just thinking about training and and winning things, you know, so. Schlegel, you have time to chat me, so do you have time to participate? <laughs> no. Um, I would say that uh, something that I've gained is a lot of good habits. I think this actually gave me the time to develop good habits. Great one. Thank you. Maybe one more. Anyone something you've lost or something not good that's happened that you want to share? That's okay. We can continue on if no one has anything. Oh, Lucy, did you have something? Yeah, and actually, my name's Chris. I don't oh. know why it says it says Lucy, but um, um, one of the things that I've I've lost is, um, I think the ability to not fear as much. Mm. I think before this all hit, I felt like I had a hold on anxiety. And I could kind of um, manage it. And then this all just hit and everything just, everything has just hit so hard that, you know, fighting fear and, you know, something that I used to be able to just throw off the table and not worry about it mm. keeps going around in my mind. And that's, that's been a tough one. Thank you so much. Um, okay, if there are no other ones, um, I'll also share mine, kind of going off Wheezy's um, bad thing or, or thing that wasn't so great. Um, yeah, our season got canceled, um, senior season specifically, so so much hype and excitement going in, and then the rug was kind of pulled out from under us, and um, those emotions and those feelings were very challenging and still are challenging, um, but ones that I think God is helping us all navigate through. and. My good thing would be that, similar to all of you, I feel like God has never done a greater work in me or taught me more um, than he is teaching me right now. And that is something that I, I wouldn't trade anything for. And so I really want you to keep those things, both of those things, or just bad things or just good things in the, in the back of your mind, kind of as we continue through this evening. But thank you all for sharing those things. I know um, some of those aren't easy. So one word <clears throat> or theme, if you will, that has really made itself known throughout this year for, for me personally and for the world is the word tension. Things are just like so incredibly tense. The pandemic is tense. Our current political climate is tense. Racial injustice is tense. Our families and relationships are tense. The community here in State College, I think safe to say is all tense. Um, no, thank you to Penn State football. Hopefully we don't have any players on. Sorry. Um, athletics is tense. We are so tense with fear and so tense with worry and so tense with potential positive COVID-19 results or quarantines or whatever. Um, we're tense with exhaustion and fatigue. And there is death among us. So many people have died and people close to us have died. I think we can all know at least one person who has been directly um, fatally affected by the coronavirus. 
you know, there's grief and there's sadness and there's an increase of depression and anxiety and worry and sickness and hatred and injustice. And it's just like, it goes on and on and on and on. And I know I don't need to tell any of you about this because you're all living it firsthand. Um, and whether or not this season has been more good or more bad for you, I think we can all agree that it's been tense and that it has been heavy. Um, and I won't lie, there are days, more days than not, that I stop and wonder and ask, God, what are you doing? What is going on? Why is this happening? Why do people have to die like this? Why is there so much hatred and sickness and, and anxiety? Why are things so tense? Like, why? And I think that's human nature is to ask why. Um, so in asking some of these questions and exploring this tension that I personally have felt and I feel in the world, the Lord led me to the book of Habakkuk, which took me a very long time to learn how to pronounce. Um, yeah, it is not, yeah, it was a tough one. I had to like look it up on Google and like hear it and everything. Um, wow, that is random. You might be thinking to yourself, and I would agree because I had never read it in my life. I had never um, looked at a single page or verse in Habakkuk. Um, I had heard obviously of him, but I knew nothing about him. Um, and it's something I can't explain. And I think that ultimately is just God and you can't explain him. Um, so it was, it was so random, but God through a Bible study, um, led me to the book of Habakkuk and I'm really excited and thankful that he did, because I think it's a story that can relate a lot to what we're going through right now. Um, because it's a story that starts in utter and complete confusion as to what God is doing in the world, but ultimately ends in the fullness of joy that can be found when the Lord rids us of our tension and of our problems and fills us with the joy that can be found when we find him in the midst of all of those things. And when we realize that the goodness of God is not circumstantial at all. Um, so to provide a little background, we're going to watch a, a very short video kind of on the book of Habakkuk. It's only three chapters. Um, but Habakkuk was a prophet who realized that God was going to use the godless military of Babylon or Chaldeans, um, who we'll see in the video, um, to bring God's judgment upon his own people of Judah. So essentially using a godless nation, these people that were horrible, to punish a godly nation, the people of Judah. Um, and it made no sense. There was injustice, corruption, evil despair flooding the streets of Judah. And it seemed as though the Lord was only feeding into that by using the Babylonians. Um, it seemed like God didn't care and only wanted to make it worse. And Habakkuk was bold in letting God know his thoughts and his feelings. He voiced everything to God which I think is something so cool that we can really learn from, from this book. Not a day passed where Habakkuk didn't cry out in helplessness, asking God, why don't you seem to make any sense? What are you doing? What is going on? Um, and the prophet did something even more important that makes his feelings known to God. He waited and he listened um, to what God was teaching him in that season. And it was waiting and listening that turned to prayer. And it was only there that he found the fullness of life in knowing that despite the troubles and evils and darknesses of Judah and of the world and of the U.S. in 2020, that the righteous live by faith and faith alone. And that the joy and peace of God, as I said earlier, is not circumstantial. Um, and that even when God isn't good, I mean, even when life isn't good, God still is. Um, Habakkuk was like many of us in our puzzling complaints to God, in our utter confusion, in our cries and yells for help. Um, but where we can learn from him most is that he chose not to stay in that place. He chose not to stay in his misery, in his depression, in his anxiety, in his fear. Um, though there was unavoidable tension in Judah, he didn't wish it away. He didn't ask God to take away that pain. He didn't stay in his pain and his sorrow and his anger. He ended up rejoicing in the tension, trusting that every detail of our lives um, for God is worked into something good in God's timing and only in God's timing. So, Will, if you wouldn't mind, please playing that short video, if you can. I'll see what I can do about making sure you even get sound. Okay, yeah, we'll see. If not, it's not that big of a deal. Quick three minute summary. There's something I have to click on, and I got to make sure I do it correctly. Hmm. Hold on, let me find it. Okay. There we go. 
I knew I could do it. We knew you could too. <laughs> Maybe. We knew you could do it. What do you do when God feels distant? When you wonder if God's even listening or if your prayers are just hitting the ceiling? I'll tell you what you do. You read the book of Habakkuk. The Israelites had functionally disobeyed all of the covenant, and by 600 BC, half of the country was in exile. The other half would be within 20 years. So Habakkuk prays, how long will I cry for help and you won't hear? Surprisingly, God answers, and he says, I'm doing something that you wouldn't even believe if I told you. God says, I'm using the Chaldeans. Habakkuk is like, wait, um, what? The worst people ever? Can you even do that in your holiness? And he gets no reply. So then Habakkuk takes a walk and stands alone on a watchtower in the breeze. It's a bit like overly emo, but mostly he's just waiting to hear back from God. Then he gets his answer. God says this, write this down, Habakkuk. If it seems slow to happen, just wait for it. God's like, yup, the Chaldeans, they're my puppets. And I'm going to teach you jokers a lesson about obedience and the Torah and doing what Moses said. God then gives them five woes full of clear instruction. Then Habakkuk prays this awesome prayer, including this ending. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He brings my feet up on the high places. Sounds like the Psalms, and he meant it that way because the end of the book is an instruction to use this prayer in worship at the synagogue. And that's the whole book right there. Habakkuk is worried that God doesn't hear him. Then he's angry with God for using an evil people group to accomplish his plans. Each time God answers him and then Habakkuk prays. The message of Habakkuk is faith. Faith when you can't see what's in front of you. Can you imagine reading all of the promises in the Torah and seeing none of them? Your cousins are in exile thousands of miles away. There's no Messiah yet. The people ruined everything that Moses said would happen in Deuteronomy and you're living in a thick failure. In those moments, God desires faith like the faith of Habakkuk. George Herbert said in 1633 in a poem called Faith, Faith makes me anything, or all that I believe is in the sacred story. And where sin places me in Adam's fall, faith sets me higher in his glory. We're stuck here in the Minor Prophets, in all the judgments. God's righteously giving out to these people to Assyria, to Babylon, to Nineveh, to many other nations, and his own nation. But if we keep waiting by faith, we'll get to the promised son. He who publishes peace, the seed from the stump of David, heaven's son and earth's savior, Jesus Christ. God created, man fell, Jesus promised. My microphone fell. Jesus fulfilled, Jesus followed, Jesus returning, and the Bible is God's word. Thank you, Will. And then you can pull up um, the first chapter if you want to mind. So I just felt like that video um, did a great job of just quickly summarizing it. Again, it's three chapters, super quick, but there's so much to be gained from it that hopefully um, we'll see here just in a few minutes. Um, so the first chapter, Habakkuk starts out pleading out to God, how long, O Lord, must I call for help? but you do not listen. Violence is everywhere, I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed and there's no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. I read that first chapter and I was like, like was this just written? Like it, it genuinely was so applicable to, to what we're facing in our, in our current world and in our individual lives and both um, in our society as well. Um, and kind of, as I said earlier, Habakkuk starts in such, ang like such anguish and such um, pleading to God to, to change these circumstances, to, to answer as to why these things are happening. But I think the way that he ends the chapter kind of in a back and forth through prayer and worship um, to God, he ultimately comes to the conclusion that, that he can find joy and that faith is all he needs and that faith is who he is. And faith is what is going to get him through whatever it is that God is doing. God is asking him to wait and to be patient and to trust him that even though it seems like he doesn't make sense and that he doesn't care, that faith is what he needs and that faith will get him through. Um, and I love the Lord's reply in that saying, look around at all the nations, look and be amazed for I am doing something in your own day. So as Habakkuk will be alive, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it, like I think of Ephesians 3.20, which says that the Lord 
is able to do immeasurably more than anything we could ever ask for or imagine. Like I imagine God telling us what he's doing and we can't even believe it. Like we are so stuck in our humanity and in our, in our current season that like we can't even fathom what he's doing. Like we have no clue and that's hope and that is our faith and, and that promise there in the Lord's reply, verse five specifically, is what we have to hold on to. We have to hold on to it. Like if I told you, you would not believe me. It's that good. You know, Romans 8, 18, the, the current suffering is nothing compared to the joy that is to come. Like that is our hope. And that's what our faith is established in. And that's what Habakkuk does such a beautiful job in reminding us of. Um, so then kind of moving on to chapter three, um, the end specifically, I, I love the way that this, this book ends. Um, in, in the New Living Translation, and then, Will, I'm going to ask you to put in the message too, just because it's such a great visual. But, um, you know, he says, I trembled inside when I heard this. My lips quivered with fear. My legs gave way beneath me. I shook in terror. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who invade us, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. Like, oh, that is such a beautiful picture. And again, I love this, this translation of it in the, uh, in the message. I'm a big message girl. I think it just like puts it all into perspective and puts it in very modern terms, which I think can be effective if um, applied the right way. Um, but yeah, just the last verse will. Um, yeah, he says, though the cherry, ble the cherry trees don't blossom and the strawberries don't ripen, though the apples are worm eaten and the wheat fields stunted, though the sheep hens are sheepless and the cattle barns empty, I'm singing joyful praise to God. I'm turning cartwheels of joy to my Savior God, counting on God's rule to prevail. I take heart and gain strength. I run like a deer. I feel like I'm king of the mountain. I just think that that's a great... Um, a, a great visual to go along with it. And I, and I love that line, cartwheels of joy. And again, reading that line in the context of what Habakkuk was facing in this chapter, like that he's able to do cartwheels of joy for the Lord, even though that so many things are wrong and so many things aren't going his way, I think is just such a beautiful image of what faith can do and how powerful faith can be. Um, so kind of going off of that, um, I think what we can learn from Habakkuk the most is that perhaps the most important part of our journey through the valley of death and through our troubles and through our challenges is that our focus is everything and our attention is everything. And we must ask our, ourselves, where is our attention? Because when Habakkuk's attention was on evil and on what was wrong and on what God wasn't doing or on himself or on the Babylonians, he was miserable and he was angry, and he was restless. He was full of anxiety and anger toward others and toward God. Um, I think something that's so cool that we can learn a lot from is the Hebrew translation of the word anxiety. The Hebrew word is, I'm gonna butcher this, and I'm sorry, marizo, mar, mar, marizo, yeah, that's, uh, that's most likely wrong, but it's okay, but it translates to the word distracted, so to be anxious essentially means to be distracted. So in the moments that we are the most anxious, it's likely that those are the moments that we're most distracted from God's will and God's promises and God's presence that is constantly with us and constantly comforting us. When we are most anxious, our attention is the most compromised. Like that just, that clears it up. Like when we are the most anxious, it's when we're the most distracted. It's when we see God the least. Um, but when Habakkuk's attention was on the fact that God is good, no matter the circumstance, when his attention was on the Lord's promises being true and trustworthy, and when his attention was on the fact that the Lord was his strength, he walked in faith and in joy, and God changed his heart and the nation of Judah as a result. Um, I think this is a very dramatic comparison, but I myself had a little Habakkuk situation um, quite recently. Um, I was exposed to the coronavirus, which wasn't fun, um, in mid-September, and I had to immediately enter into complete isolation in East View Terrace, which was great. Um, yeah, Schlegel. But um, I was stuck in a tiny freshman dorm for two weeks. No leaving the room. No going outside. 
and I'm a big outside girly. I love the outdoors. I couldn't interact with anyone. I'm also a big people person. I like talking if you can't tell. And I couldn't interact with anybody. It was so sad. I only tried to interact with the kind hearted servants of the Lord, the women who dropped off my food every day, but they would like run away as I was like trying to make conversation with them. And it was, it was bad. They're like, Rona. And I'm like, Hey, what's up? Um, but it was just me and the Lord and Harris hall room three thirty. And I won't lie to you. I was Habakkuk as I entered into quarantine. I was scared and annoyed and frustrated and complaining to God nonstop. Why did I have to do this? Why was this necessary? What are you doing? asking him and complaining to him with all these, all these thoughts. Um, similar to the prophet, I let God have it a little bit. And I think that God likes it when we bring him everything, even our sassiest emotions, um, which I have plenty of. And when we just bring it all to him, I don't think he just wants us on our best day. I don't think he just wants us when we're like feeling holy after Sunday service and we're like, love you, Lord. I think he wants all of it. And I think he wants us even when we're distraught and when we're angry at him and when we don't get it and when we want answers. Um, so I let, I let the Lord have it a little bit, but it wasn't until my first night in, in the queue that I lit my candles. Um, I started reading my Bible and I just started to pray and completely surrender. And it was prayer to the point of me being flat on my back, just in tears, sobbing, to Jesus, just giving him everything, proclaiming my resounding trust in him, just, just giving it all to him. And it was that moment, like that Habakkuk moment, that emo moment that they were talking about was the moment he turned everything around for me. Um, you know, I told him, Lord, I have no clue what you're doing. I don't know why I'm here. I don't need to know, but would you do a work in me in these two weeks? Would you help me grow? Would you remind me that you're my joy no matter what happens, no matter the circumstances? I love you. I trust you. I will praise you in the highlands and the heartache all the same, Weezy. If anyone knows that song, Highlands, Song of Ascent by Hillsong Worship, you have to listen to it. It's so good. Um, but like Habakkuk, once I came to my knees in prayer, the Lord began to fill my heart with so much peace and bless the days to come. People kept asking me, they were like, how horrible was it? Like, was it so bad? Like, I've heard so many terrible things, like the food stinks, all this stuff. I'm like, I had a great time. Like, okay, it wasn't awesome. I don't want to go back, but like, like God, God did such a work in me. Um, each morning I rose, she's like, well, I wish I was there. Yeah, I know. Um, each morning I rose and proclaimed that this would be the day and that even though I wouldn't be going outside, or hugging any of my friends, or getting to get coffee at Dunkin', even though my blessed teammates brought me plenty of it, bless you all, you all have a beautiful place in heaven, um, that I would rejoice and be glad because God was with me in that room. Um, and he was my constant companion, always by my side. And Romans 8, 5 says that for a mindset on the flesh leads to death, but a mindset controlled by the spirit finds life and peace. And nothing became more true than those words when I was in, in the queue. Um, but when my focus was on me and my circumstance, I was miserable. And there were days that were like that where I'm like, oh my gosh, life sucks. Like I'm missing this and that, and I'm so sad. But when my focus was Jesus and serving him in any way I could from isolation and trusting that he was good, even when life wasn't, he brought me freedom and he brought me joy and he brought me peace. And it was not easy. Again, there were good days and bad days, but God really put something on my heart early on in quarantine that changed my time in there and really made it an absolutely life-changing experience. Um, and it was the concept of attention, but he spelled it differently. Will, can you pull up that photo? He spelled it differently. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Okay, I'll wait. The Lord tells me to wait. I will wait. Guys, he spelled it wrong, so you'll see. Drum roll. He spelled it like that. He spelled it attention. Tension. He spelled it with an S. And I'm like, Lord, do you need autocorrect? Because people who know me know I have like kind of a thing with grammar and everything's gotta be capitalized and spelled right. And I'm like, um, Jesus, he spelled that wrong. Um, I don't know if you like need me to help you out here, but um, besides the point, he was always right. God is always right. Um, and he makes no mistakes. And that surely was not one. So I wrote that down. I was like, okay, attention. Like, I don't know what that means, but I think you're going to show me. Um, so that's what I want to talk about next. Where in the midst of all this tension, 
is our attention. Are we wishing away this tension that we're facing? Are we wishing away the pain or the suffering or the unknown of it all? Are we wishing away the discomfort that we feel? Um, you know, in the midst of my anxiety and fear in that room, where was I going to look? Um, in the middle of strife in Judah, where and who did Habakkuk choose to run to, choose to turn to, choose to trust in? Um, and so I want to pose another question. Where has your attention been? What has your focus been, either good or bad? Please feel free to share either, because um, I really feel like we can all learn from each other. Has your focus helped you or hurt you? And why is your focus so important to you? So if a few of you could share that, I would love it. Can be anything. No wrong answers. Sam, I really, really appreciate what you're saying, and it's just really resonating with me. I think that um, we're going through some tough things with our youngest son right now, and it's really easy to get snowed under, to get so caught up in that, that we lose sight of everything. I mean, it, it just becomes the dark cloud that covers everything up, and tension goes up, and, the, and, and all that, and it's really been cool because the times when we've been able to lift our eyes off of the circumstances mm -hmm. and look to God, even if it's just to look at him and just cry out, God, I hate this. Mm -hmm. um, at least it's acknowledging him that he's there and it changes the perspective on the cloud because we've just focused beyond the cloud in a way that's really, really cool. So thank you so much for bringing this up. Thank you for sharing, Ellen. Anyone else? have a focus or attention that they want to share? I can say something. I'd love it if you did, Max. <laughs> um, so when you ask me, like, where's your attention been? I think my issue has been that, like, I feel like I'm not really attentive to a lot of things. Like, I feel like it's not there in general. Like, I feel like I'm present in the moment and and that's good, but I think I've kind of been just like in a haze almost like just trying to get through like another day or trying to get through another week. So in my sense, like I just think I need to focus more on something. I don't really know what it is, but I've just been lacking like in general. Yeah, that's so real, Maddie. Thank you for sharing that. I feel like a lot of us are just like trying to get by, like get to another day, another day. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else want to share? Is it my time to save the day? <laughs> I think it is. I think it is. Go ahead, Lace. <sighs> um, <clears throat> I think that too often my focus has been on others, mm -hmm. not in like a way of like helping them, but in a way of like, what are they doing? They're doing these things and like, can't really do anything about anybody else but you. And I think if you, turn things back on yourself like even how you're responding to others and how you're like where you're choosing to react how you're choosing to react that's the only thing that you can control you know I feel like I've spent so much time blaming others for what they've done when really it's just my reaction like I just don't need to react so dramatically to everything because not everything deserves that reaction um so I think that's something to think about so good Thank you. I think a lot of my attention has been on just like emotion in general, mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out what it means, like what certain emotions mean and like just with the uncertainty of like the situation that we're in, there's just a lot of different emotions and trying to work through those. Thanks, Shelby. You want more? Sam? Hello. Can you hear me? Is that Tuna? Yes, I'm I'm listening. I know we can't see you though, Tuna. It's just his iPad, but I recognize your I voice. I know I'm I'm looking kinda crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm chilling back here. I I got a chance to to get in there and hear you doing a wonderful job. 
you know, I was thinking about what you were asking and <clears throat> about the attention or attention thing. Uh, it was interesting. I had a conversation with a, an inmate today who is, he just got paroled today and he's been denied parole. I don't know how many times he's gotten so many hits to stay in prison because of his case. And so he was telling me today he finally got paroled. Um, but in the midst of that, uh, he can't have any contact with his wife once he gets out. <laughs> and he was talking about how he was happy he's being paroled, but he's having a hard time really having joy about it. And I said to him, I said, I understand how you feel. But at that moment, I felt like the Lord was saying to me to say to him that his joy and that our joy should be in the Lord, mm -hmm. not in our circumstances, not the fact that we got parole, not the fact that we, you know, got blessed with this and whatever it might be. But mm -hmm. I think what you've been talking about is that sometimes we lose our focus about where our joy uh, lies and where it, it exists. So in the midst of it all, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's you know a sickness, whether it's family situation, whatever it is, it's hard. Mm. But we still have to remain focused on him because within him is where our joy actually lies because he gives us joy that that's unspeakable, uh, it can't be explained, mm -hmm. it can't be taken away. And somehow or another, in the midst of our circumstances, uh, we can still remain joyful if we remember that our joy lies within him. So I, I just wanted to participate, that's okay and share tonight but uh you're doing an excellent job you're a hard act to follow tuna I, what can i say i don't know not, the bar yeah. pretty high last week <laughs> I, I didn't feel that way but i appreciate that i think we all felt that way yes absolutely well, praise, Thank praise you. the lord thank that, you that was wonderful um and i think just like going off what tuna said and and going back to that romans 8 verse um i think you know my when my attention is off the Lord, like it's, it often goes to the world and what is worldly. And when the verse says for a mindset on the flesh leads to death, like that also is synonymous to a mindset on the world and to all that is going wrong in the world. And there's so many times throughout scripture that the Lord, specifically Jesus reminds us, we're not of this world. Like we don't belong here. This is, this is our, our temporary assignment, you know, but our eternal joy, our unshakable joy, our unshakable trust is, is in him and his, him alone. And, and, and that is the root of, of joy and peace that, that isn't fleeting. Cause I think we experience it in, in bits and pieces, but we won't experience it in fullness and in abundance until we have that mindset on the spirit. Um, so thank you all for, for sharing, for sharing those things. Um, I really appreciate it. And I know, again, some of those aren't easy to share. But the last point that I want to hit um, mostly has to do with the end of Habakkuk. And if you have not caught on by now, um, I do not know what God is doing in the world. And there is no perfect ending to Habakkuk. There is no, um, you know, happy ever after and, and, and perfection at the end. But it's that the Lord's strength is enough and that he can you know, uh, the message saying, I'm king of the mountain, like Habakkuk is okay because of his faith. And he can go on even not knowing um, because of his faith. And it's by faith and, um, you know, by the power and strength of, of God that he is able to do those things. Um, and so I don't know his plan. And I don't know when this suffering that is 2020 is going to end. I think we're all about ready for it to be done. Um, but I do know one thing, and it's that just like in Judah, the Lord is testing our faith, challenging our character, shaping our souls, and most importantly, refining our hearts in a way that we have 
never experienced before. Um, he is doing an eternal work in each of every one of us that is so beautiful. Um, and through the pain and through that tension, Jesus is shining his light onto the deepest and darkest parts of us. And Habakkuk didn't know what God, would, God was doing, but even in a book that is only three short chapters, like it's so short, the change in how he spirit and the change of his heart is so abundantly clear because he started the book yelling at God and he ended the book doing cartwheels of joy. And it's three pages, four pages. And God can, can Friday to Sunday, you know, like he will rise. He can change in a heartbeat. He can change your situation in a second. Um, you know, there's no limiting what he can do. It's three chapters and we see a totally different person at the end than we do in the beginning. And I think that's, again, such a key point to get out of this is that even in those troubling circumstances, Habakkuk found joy. And it was in his troubling circumstance that the grace of God changed who he was, changed genuinely the character of his heart and his intention and refined his soul. Um, and so there's two short verses in the New Testament, one in Romans 5 and James 1, that I've been holding very close to my heart um, just through this season. But, you know, I think they also really do a great job of complementing the transformation that have a fake experience because we are dealing with two completely different people um, from beginning to end of this chapter or of this book. So, Will, if you wouldn't mind pulling up Romans 5 first. Um, and you can just leave the Passion Translation. So it says, but that's not all. Even in times of trouble, we have joyful confidence, knowing that our pressures will develop in us patient endurance, and patient endurance will refine our character, and proven character leads us back to hope. And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy, because now we can experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. I love that word cascading. I think that's, that's just so beautiful. Um, and then if you wouldn't mind pulling up James 1 as well, please, Will. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this one. I know my girl KB is a big James girl, so this one's for you, Kelly. Um, says, consider it a sheer gift, friends. Um, I had a translation in, um, in quarantine that said, consider it pure joy, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors so you don't try to get out of anything prematurely let it do its work so you become mature and well developed not deficient in any way um will would you mind just putting also the passion translation of that too thank you Yeah, so similar. Um, my fellow believers, when it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. For you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure all things. And then as your endurance grows even stronger, it will release perfection into every part of your being until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. Like, what? Oh, that just gives me the chills. Like, those verses make all this worth it. Like I read that and I'm like, okay, God, if there's going to be death and there's going to be sorrow and there's going to be racism and there's going to be hatred. Okay. Because you're doing something deeper. Just like in Habakkuk, it wasn't about the suffering. It was about the internal work. It was about the changing of our hearts. So God is working on your heart. He's working on your character. Let us not wish away these times, but instead rejoice in them. Let us be still in the tension of life right now. Let's make our home in the tension. That's what Jesus did. Jesus, no one knows tension like Jesus knows tension. God is cleaning, purifying, refining the deepest parts of your being and of your soul. And easy and comfortable times can't do that. They just can't. Comfort and growth cannot coexist. And he had to get us out of our comfort zone. He had to make us hurt a little bit to do that. And sometimes that hurts feel like that hurts feel that hurt feels like I can speak English. It is just going on and on and on and that it's never ending. But he had to rid us of distraction. He had to remind us that we need him, that we are so desperate for him. And there's one more scripture that goes along with what I just read in Romans and James. I promise it's the last one. It's Matthew 5, 8. 
specifically in the message. And it says, you're blessed when you can get your inside world, your mind, your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. So we can't be like Habakkuk and have the ability to see God's goodness in the outside world and in all of its tension until we have our inside worlds right with God. And it's through prayer and it's through worship and it's through trust and it's through our hearts that we do that. And it wasn't until God used Habakkuk's circumstance in changing his attention that he could change his heart. I'm going to say that again because I think that's the biggest thing to get away. It wasn't until God used Habakkuk's, Habakkuk's circumstances of suffering and of death and of sadness and of injustice and of hatred, because it was all of it, and we have all of that today in our current climate. It wasn't until he could bring about those things that he could change Habakkuk's heart, and he could turn the, the guy who was yelling at God for his pain to then someone who's doing cartwheels of joy for God in, in, in elation and happiness because of the way that his faith in the Lord filled him up. And that is so hard and that's so challenging, but I really believe that God, that is what God is calling us to do. I believe he's changing our hearts and molding us to look like him. And scripture tells us, I believe in, in Matthew, it says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And where your attention is, even in the tension and the heaviness, there your heart will be also. God wants your heart and he wants your tension. He planted you in the season in order for you to grow unlike you've ever grown before. Timotheus Pope, a couple weeks ago, I'm sure a bunch of you um, heard him speak, but he said that the Lord could have chosen you to be alive in any place at any time in history. And he chose you to be where you are right now, in whatever position you're in, in whatever state you're in. He chose for you to be right where you're at right now. And that's intentional. God makes no mistakes, like I said, with the grammar. I'm like, Lord, you spelled it wrong. Maybe this is wrong, but no, he makes no mistakes. Like he put you here for a reason and he's, he's digging deeper into you, but we have to let him. He wants your good days and your bad days. He wants your cries out for mercy. He wants your pleads for justice. He wants your yelling and your screaming and your sobbing and your confusion and your questions, but he's not afraid of you. I think that's such an important reminder. God's not afraid of you. He knows your heart better than you know it yourself. And he knows the work he's going to do in you. He knew what he was doing with the Babylonians. And he knows tension better than any of us. He's the creator of tension and of discomfort. Jesus, again, lived through so much tension and so much discomfort. Every day of his life was uncomfortable. Every day of his life was uncomfortable. Jesus owned tension. Tension obeyed Jesus and God isn't afraid of 2020. He isn't afraid of the coronavirus. He isn't afraid of the election. The wind and waves obey his name and his voice. The enemy obeys his name and his voice. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves of that because I forget. I forget he's bigger. I sometimes forget that he's stronger and he is most importantly with us as we wait and with us as he's transforming our hearts. And so he wants your attention and he wants your heart, not parts of it. He wants all of it. Um, there's a beautiful C.S. Lewis quote that reads, the more we let God take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. The more, this is now me, not C.S. Lewis, but the more that we give ourselves to God and the more that we just hand it all, even the parts that we don't like and the parts that we're afraid of, the parts that scare us, there are parts of myself that I'm like, whoa, what's that? Like, that's scary. God, I don't know what to do about that. Like, give it to him. Because the more that we fully give our hearts and our character and our faith to God, the more that he's going to shape it. Because he's the author and perfecter of our faith. So I pray that you will all give it to him. I pray that you all, many of whom have been miserable or great, for the whole year, whatever boat you're in, I think this can apply to all of us. I just pray that you can look back one day and deem this season of life one so full of tension as one of the most life-changing moves of God, of our Savior that you have ever experienced, because I think he is doing something that we've never experienced and that he's changing us and, and forcing us to grow in ways that we never thought possible. And that's what he did with Habakkuk. 
I'm sure he wasn't expecting that. I'm sure he didn't think that God was going to choose the Babylonians of all people to come and to seek justice upon the, the nation of Judah, but he did. And God is full of surprises. But I truly believe that when we wait and when we trust in his timing, that we will look back on this time and, and on the things we've lost and on the things we've gained. And we'll, we'll just look at it and say, God, you've never done a greater work in me. You've never done a greater work in this world. You've never moved more than you are right now. So let's please pray. Lord God, thank you for this season, God. It feels weird, Jesus, to praise you for pain and to praise you and thank you for suffering, God, but we're going to do it because we won't just do cartwheels of joy, God, when our lives are perfect because they rarely are, God. You promise us that in this world we will have suffering. We will. It's not a surprise, God. Nothing surprises you. The question is not, is it written? It's a statement that it is written, God. You are the author of our lives, Jesus, and none of this surprises you, Lord. And God, it scares the enemy, and it scares hate when we praise you, even when it feels crazy wrong and like it makes no sense, God. It makes no sense to do cartwheels of joy when 200,000 people are dead, Lord, but we will do them because we trust you. We trust you and we know that you are working everything together for the good of those who love you, Jesus. That's a promise. That's a commandment. And we will trust in it, God. Just like Habakkuk did, God, we will trust in it because you are our strength and our song. You make us king of the mountain, God. You are our power in this season. You are our strength in our weakest moment, God. When we are at our weakest, you are at your strongest, God. And I think it's safe to say we've all felt weak during this time, God. We've all have felt helpless and hopeless. But Jesus, it's in those places that you meet us. You meet us and you say, I'm here. I've got you. I love you. I'm doing a work in you. I'm doing a work in this world. You just have to trust me. You have to trust me. You have to trust my timing. Because what is to come, you won't even believe. You will not even believe it because it's so good. And I'm so for you. And I love you. Jesus, thank you for reminding us of this love. Thank you for this time together, God, thank you for vulnerability, and thank you, Jesus, for always telling us what we need to hear, God, right when we need to hear it. We thank you for this work you're doing, God, and we will wait, and we can't wait to see what you're doing, Jesus. It's in your precious name we praise you. Amen. Amen. Sam, thanks uh, Thanks for bringing it home and uh, doing a great job tonight. So that's pretty exciting, um, and for the word that you brought from Habakkuk. So, Hey, for uh, Kelly, um, I know you normally don't join us, so I'll leave the room open if you want to hang out with your friends for a little bit afterwards. Um, and for uh, If you are new and you want to just connect, uh, hit Shelby Craft up with something like that. Um, just have some contact information, and she'll get that out to me if it's new. And if not, I'm just really grateful. It's almost 9 o'clock, and so if you need to jump off and get a test done or study or do something else. Um, but I'll leave the room open if you want to hang out with Kelly for a little bit. Um, until that goes, until it goes away. And if I have to leave, Sam, what I'll do is I'll just give you control to, like, so you can run the meeting. Okay. So. okay. Thanks for showing up tonight. Thank you guys. Love you all. Thank you, Sam.